Thank you uh, very much. I want to extend uh, a warm welcome to our most special guests. We are going to, uh, to start uh, a panel on East Asia. Uh, this is a, uh, a part of the world which in many ways is going to be very significant for the world's trajectory of the 21st century. We're very grateful for uh, the participation of our distinguished guests. And uh, allow me to introduce uh, the moderator for this panel, uh, my friend uh, Brett Stevens uh, from the Wall Street Journal. He is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, prior to Wall Street Journal, Brett was uh, editor-in-chief of uh, the Jerusalem Post. And now he's the deputy editor of the Wall Street Journal, and he's overviewing uh, editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal for Asia. So Brett, uh, the floor is yours. Let's, um, let's begin uh, with a country which we will call Country A. It is a huge land power. It is bordered on many, uh, on many sides by many countries. It is emerging from centuries of political turmoil and humiliation in a 35-year burst of economic dynamism hitherto almost unprecedented in history. It is now the second largest economy in the world, second only to the United States. This country has long been abused by outside powers, but now the tables are beginning to turn, and it is starting to feel its own very considerable strength. It has a desperate need for mineral resources, access to which can only be found abroad and from which this country fears it could be cut off by its potential adversaries, particularly one that happens to have the world's most powerful navy. One result is that country A is now beginning to build a very powerful naval fleet of its own. This country has an autocratic government, but it is not indifferent or insensible to public opinion. From time to time, it likes to stoke nationalist sentiments in order to shore up its own domestic political legitimacy. It has a military whose officers are often heard hankering publicly for war. The view of those officers has at times frightened their civilian masters who seek both to rein them in but also to appease them, chiefly through large annual increases in military expenditure. This is a country whose sense of confidence, importance, and self-importance is matched by a deep sense of geopolitical and cultural insecurity. Now let's turn to a second country, country B. It wasn't very long ago that this country was seen as the most important and the most technologically advanced in its region but it is enduring a decades-long period of stagnation marked by a falling birth rate and disappointing economic growth. Country B just happens to be the old historical enemy of country A. Indeed, in a previous century, the armies of country B ravaged the territory of country A. Though the two countries have deep economic ties, there is a deeper layer of mistrust which leaders of both countries occasionally stoke by acts that are at once purely symbolic but also provocative. This country is still quite powerful, but it is not perhaps quite powerful enough to defend itself alone. So it relies on its security, it relies for its security on its allies, particularly one ally that happens to be the world's greatest naval power but it can never be absolutely certain that this ally would hazard its own security for its defense, which adds to its sense of strategic unease. Lately, country A and country B are having a tremendous dispute over a tiny bit of territory that is of no great strategic significance. Indeed, hardly anyone knew it existed before it burst into public view. 
but this has become a matter of face and could conceivably trigger an accidental war. Of course, there is also country C, and this country is not, geographically speaking, a part of the region. But, hi, but it has been involved economically, militarily, and politically in the affairs of this region for a very long time. Country C sees itself as a strategic balancer, albeit one with its own very definite commercial and strategic interests. Over the years, country C has been an ally of country A when country A was, threatened by a, was, was being threatened by a hostile neighbor. It has also maintained friendly relations with country B, although countries B and C have, have themselves fought wars. Now country B feels that it is being threatened by country A, and country C is becoming more openly hostile to country A, which more and more it views as a dangerous economic competitor with an authoritarian government and potentially dangerous and game-changing ambitions. Country C, by the way, also has traditionally guaranteed the security of a couple of smaller regional countries, one of which, country D, is supposed to be a kind of neutral country, but has long been threatened by country A and could easily be overrun by it. Should country A decide to do so, country C might well find itself forced to intervene militarily against it. Finally, and in the meantime, there are a number of other middle-sized powers in this region, we can call them countries E, F, and G, which are looking at the rise of country A with a combination of admiration and alarm, and at the troubles of country B with a combination of schadenfreude and alarm. Countries E, F, and G have their own relations and experiences with country C, not all of them by any means positive. Now, I offer all of this knowing that Wilhelmine Germany is not modern China, the French Third Republic is not modern Japan, and Edwardian England is not today's the United States. Taiwan is not Belgium, and countries like Italy and Serbia uh, and Pakistan, um, uh, or Italy and Serbia don't necessarily find analogs in modern day Pakistan or South Korea. And I offer it also mindful of Henry Kissinger's observation that history teaches by analogy, not identity. But I offer it also knowing that the analogies between pre-World War I Europe and modern day East Asia are at least superficially quite compelling and that they are being talked about widely by serious people. Yesterday, from this stage, we heard Dominic Levin, who divides his time between Britain and, and, um, uh, um, between Britain and Japan, himself muse about some of the worrying commonalities. I think we would all come away relieved from this panel if over the next 90 minutes or so, we can offer some reasons why the lessons of pre-1914 Europe do not apply to modern day Asia. And with that, let me just finish the, the topic by thanking VUC and the CIRSD for putting together a world-class panel to discuss today's topic. Let me also introduce our, uh, our panelists. On the far left, Shaukat Aziz is a former prime minister and finance minister of Pakistan, which followed a very distinguished career around the world in banking. Patrick Ho was for five years Secretary for Home Affairs in his native Hong Kong, following a distinguished career as an eye surgeon. Ambassador Nishida is one of Japan's most distinguished diplomats, having served in various ambassadorial posts, most recently as ambassador to the United Nations. Kevin Rudd is the former Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of Australia, following a distinguished career in both politics and diplomacy. And finally, Hassan Wirajuda was for eight years Foreign Minister of Indonesia, holding the post under two successive governments and has degrees from Harvard, Oxford, the Fletcher School of Diplomacy, and the University of Virginia. One last piece of housekeeping before we begin. We will speak in alphabetical order. I've asked the speakers to keep their, their talks, their initial remarks, to no longer than between five to eight minutes. And we will, we will do so alphabetically, starting with uh, Prime Minister Aziz, through Foreign Minister uh, Wirajuda, and then we'll go to questions for me and hopefully a conversation uh, with the audience. So I hope we have a lot of fun. Thank you very much. You're on to do it from here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of time, I've done something I normally don't do. I've put some thoughts on paper. 
so we can move faster. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the world today is markedly different than it was in 1914. Globalization, nuclear weapons, the collapse of the old imperial orders have transformed the nature of conflict and the geopolitical landscape. While we must not dwell too much on the past, it is important to use its lessons in dealing with the problems we face today or will face tomorrow. In the words of Mark Twain, history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <coughs> First, we must be careful when entering strategic partnerships. One of the causes of the First World War was an existing system of major alliances and treaties thought to be the means of war prevention. Instead, it meant that once conflict broke out, it escalated into one of the deadliest wars in history. The First World War, which left over 16 million people dead and 20 million more were wounded. What should have happened as a, to tackle a localized conflict between Serbia and the Austria-Hungary rapidly grew through an elaborate treaty system that linked large and small European nations together. Alliances are too rigid, and that allow little room for soft power. They can do more harm sometimes than good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the alignment of global power today is very different than it used to be. It no longer is the center of power Europe anymore. The ties between major powers are often rooted in economic partnership. While these do not much resemble the Entente, the Triple Entente, and the Triple Alliance, we are once again seeing major world powers coming together through various agreements, including trade and investment. One example is the TTIP, etc., and the recently signed gas deal between Russia and China. These economic ties should be a force for good in today's globalized world. The more linkages and interdependencies, I strongly believe, we create between states, the more incentives they will have to preserve peace and resolve tensions at the negotiating table. Oil and gas pipelines, electricity grids, trade and investment across borders, roads, travel, common strategic goals, all these can be and are true enablers of peace. Comparisons have been made between China today and Germany in 1914, with the US being placed in the position of Britain before the First World War. But you only need to look at how connected China is with the world economy today, through its manufacturing, through its trade, and the foreign reserves they'd hold today. Instead, we should work harder to bring more isolated countries into the net rather than keep countries out, such as Iran and North Korea as an example. Now, disputable, disputed territorial claims today, as seen in the South China Sea, in South Asia and Kashmir, and in the Middle East, which we just talked about, and nationalistic tendencies create parallels between our world and the pre-1914 Europe when competition between imperial powers in the scramble for Africa created fertile grounds for war. In addition, we are faced with many new challenges from non-state actors, which didn't exist at that time. The Taliban, the Al-Qaeda, the Boko Haram, and just to name a few, and I can go on, that threaten and disrupt the system in Asia, Middle East, and Africa. This calls for prudent security policy diplomacy, dialogue, and above all, leadership. I believe today the world has a leadership deficit. Only a truly strong leader can have the courage to make the necessary concessions in a time of crisis and prevent events from spiraling into, sorry, <clears throat> I thought I'd closed it. <laughs> spiraling into, I heard you. <laughs> yeah, somebody heard me, sorry. Uh, I believe that spiraling crisis can be turned into a large-scale war if not attended to in the right way. This is something that I hope will improve with time. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we must recognize that the contribution of nuclear deterrence have made avoiding large-scale conflict very significant. The formation of NATO and the rival Warsaw Pact was an echo of the opposing alliances in 1914, also centering around Central Europe. However, in the 50s, this balance of power did not lead to war. Arguably, and this is my personal view, because of the importance or the nuclear capability they had. That was a deterrent, so they did not go for further. The importance of a nuclear deterrent in preventing war has been replicated more recently in my own region, South Asia. The fact that India and Pakistan are today major nuclear powers has allowed them to stay away from any uh, conventional wars, although tension is still there. But I think the nuclear weapons have helped keep the temperature down rather than increase it. As well as showing strength and resolve in preventing outbreaks of war, we must also show foresight in trans transitioning from it. Countries that have suffered as a result of conflict should not be punished by the winning side. We learned this all too well after the Treaty of Versailles. The humiliation of Germany after its defeat in the First World War and the unrealistic reparations it could not afford to pay to the Allies contributed to the rise of fascism and eventually led to the Second World War. Europe learned the lessons of the First World War and after defeating Germany and its allies, in 1945 implemented the Marshall Plan and a successful aid package for Japan, creating a stimulus for growth and rebuilding those war-torn nations. This boosted stability and led to lasting peace for those countries and their neighbors. As an example, we can learn a lot from these mistakes when rebuilding Afghanistan, a major area of conflict today, which has been damaged by 13 years of war and from the Soviet Union's invasion before that. The country is in need for development aid and to help it get back on its feet. A strong and vibrant Afghanistan, ladies and gentlemen, is crucial to promoting future peace and stability in South Asia. After US troops withdraw later this year, it is important for leaders to work together and help get Afghanistan back on its feet through aid, through development, and cooperation, not war. Multinational organizations such as the United Nations, the World Bank, and all the other Bretton Woods institutions can play a major part, as well as countries who have influence in the region. As we look towards the next 100 years, ladies and gentlemen, we must work together not to remit, uh, repeat the mistakes of the past. The use of leadership, cooperation, and dialogue to contain any potential crisis and to promote peace, progress, and prosperity. The world, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, is changing rapidly. A new world order is emerging, or will emerge. Change is the only constant. So all of us have to look at change as an opportunity to create a world which we can bequeath to our coming generations, which promotes peace, progress, and prosperity. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Patrick. I come from Hong Kong. I'm speaking on behalf of China. Uh, I think the title is uh, what, what lesson have we learned from the First World War. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. China was involved in the First World War. Very little of you have known that, but China, in 1914, has barely been able to stand up on his feet just right after the National Revolution when Sun Yat-sen overthrew the Qing Imperial Dynasty. And the country was still in a turmoil. It was shabble, nothing to speak of. There's no national treasure. But still, in 1979, uh, 1917, China formally declared war on Germany. And European allies let China do so. Why? Because at that time, one of the best run colony in China was Qingdao. It's a big city in Shantung area, where, which was run by Germany. There was a German colony. By having China join the Allied in the European theater, 
the Allies was able to make sure that, uh, that Germany was not able to siphon off the assets from this Chinese colony back to so support is operation in the European theater. And although China has nothing to do, <laughs> there was thousands of miles away from Europe, was let in on the First World War. Now, it's very, very important. In fact, China's participation in the First World War was not only a defining moment in modern Chinese and world history, but also the beginning of China's long journey towards international cooperation. And it was the First World War and the Paris Peace Conference in which China participating as an equal in the first time in modern history, learning how to engage with the international system, ideas, forces, trends, and collaborating with other nations in maintaining world peace and stability. But this is not the most important part of the story. The most important part of the story is in 1918 in the Versailles Treaty that China, as part of the victors, was treated as equal sitting in the winning parties platform. But to his dismay, Shantung, the, the Qingdao colony, which rightfully belonged to China, was given to Germany, which was defeated. But after the war, it was not given back to China. It was given to Japan. Now, what that has happened <laughs> has led, <laughs> has led, <laughs> come on, come on, let's listen to this, has led to the May 4th movement in 1919 in Beijing, which started as a student movement against the Japanese, against the nationalist government, because it was weak. Uh -uh. And, and, and not being able to, do, to, to stand up to, to the national uh, uh, interest. And that began as a student movement, and then expanded into a youth movement, and extended into a Chinese intelligentsia movement. And then it was at that time, and after the May 4th movement in 1919, that the intelligentsia throughout China started looking for another ideological paradigm and they look at Marxists. And that led to the formation of the Sen Chinese Communist Party in 1921 in Shanghai. Without the First World War, without this humiliation from the Versailles, I think China would not have, have, not have trotted down the path of its modern Chinese history, and the rest is, uh, is you know, is history. Well, uh, I, think, I think this is only part of the, 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 the probably the best kept secret in modern Chinese history, <laughs> that Chinese, China has something to do, and a lot to do with the First World War, and actually modern China has a lot to thank the First World War for that. Well, let's come back to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the theme of the conference. I think, well, I can speak a lot about what happened with the scenario that uh, uh, Stevens had painted, and which was a quite accurate depiction of what's happening in the world today. But I think it's more befitting uh, to a, uh, a Hollywood film script. I think you are up next for a nomination of the Academy Award besides the Pulitzer <laughs> Award. <laughs> well, joke aside, I think the crux of the question that every one of you burned to ask is what had been asked last year at the turn of the, of the year by Margaret Mamillion. Let me find his, her paper. Margaret Mamillion was a granddaughter of Lloyd George. It's now teaching in Oxford. And in December 14 of 2013, just on the eve of 2014, uh, she wrote a very illuminating article and was posted on the Brookings Institute's website, which was, very which was very influential and very illuminating as well. But the question he, she was addressing, and probably the question that every one of you were burning to ask, was does China's reemergence as a dominant economy and world power for the first time since the 1400s threatens a new world war? 
So with this, I recapitulate uh, what happened in, in Europe for the first, uh, in the First World War. And well, her, her, her answer, her conclusion was quite possibly. And that was followed by another articles in The Economist and also by other authors and, for example, the Cold War historian Anne Applebaum and, and other people like Walter Russell Meads of Bard College also. They also wrote on the same thing. And the conclusion was quite similar. It's a, it was quite possible. But I would venture to argue that things have changed since 100 years ago. We have heard last evening from Jeffrey Sachs that the dem demographies have changed for, uh, for the last 100 years. I took down some notes, OK? 100 years ago, Africa, there was only two countries, and all the others were colonies. But now today, 100 years later, Africa consists of 55 nations, one third of the world's nations into Africa. Europe, 100 years ago, 50% of all nations were in Europe. They represent 23% of the world population. And now it's only 10% of the world population. Whereas the United States, 100 years ago, have only a population of 90 million, is now over 300 million. Demographies have changed. China has grown from a small country of 400 million now to 1.3. Six billion people. The second is the economy achievement has also turned the table around. Economic achievement is important, but now China is the second largest <coughs> economic aggregate of the world. But being a big economic power does not equate to a world power. Let's look back to 100 years ago when China was challenged, very much challenged, <coughs> by the United Kingdom, by Britain at that time, at the, at the first Opium War in 1840. China's at that time, the GDP was one third of that of the world. And what stopped <coughs> that of Great Britain, and China was defeated. Then again, in 1894, in the Sino-Japanese War, China's GDP was three times that of Japan's. China was defeated by Japan. So having a strong economy, having a big GDP, does not guarantee you power. There's much more than the power. It is what constitutes in the GDP that's important. And China's GDP is made up of textile, silk, porcelain, teas, jeans, tennis shoes, Whereas in other countries, the GDP is made up of tanks, airplanes, motors, cars, hardwares. So I meant the second point I ventured to, to discuss with you is that economic power does not equate to world power. And as a matter of fact, China was very far from being a world power at this point in time. Besides having a big economic aggregate on the other fronts of, of, uh, of uh, l l l let's say, the, uh, a world forum. For example, the number <coughs> of patents, the number of uh, research and development investments, publications, scientific journals, soft power, cultural power, so forth. Uh, China is, uh, is still uh, have a long way to catch up. Okay. The third point I want to point out is that the cost is too high for a world total out world war. And if we can all look back, uh, what happened at the end of the First World War, I don't think any of these uh, people called the wars would ever uh, uh, indulge themselves in the war. And more than, one, more than 10 million people were killed in Europe. Civilization was ruined. Kaiser was gone, Austro-Hungarian Empire dissolved, the Tsar was overthrown by the Bolsheviks, France bled for a generation, and England was shorn of its flower of this youth and its treasure. And besides that, we have a nuclear deterrence at this moment, which was not at present 
at the First World War. And this is what Joseph Nye said was a crystal ball. And it is something that if you push on the pattern, on the button, I mean, everybody was just got to have to, uh, uh, I mean, say his last prayer. And at this present time, both the United States, Russia, and all the major nuclear power, if they pull the warheads together, was able to destroy the world about 100, about 1,000 times over. We certainly don't need that many warheads, but we're keeping them there to keep the peace. That's what we were told. So in order to have a overall type of a total war commitment will involve the entire continent, involve many, many countries, I think it's quite unlikely. And third, and also, the media is different. 100 years ago, telegraph was only used for very important transmission of information. And most people write letters. And information was, uh, was propagated through newspapers and, and journals. But today, everybody have a smartphone. And today, the smartphone penetration of the world is 91%. Meaning 91% of the world's population had at least one mobile telephone. And with that, the information, uh, uh, I mean, in the technology has served its purpose in propagating the, 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 the political message and also the real world situation to all the citizens. And it's not so easy to, uh, for any any uh, dictators or any rulers to call the shots and without really having the, the, the people to support it. And also throughout the world now, the democratic system and making the decision uh, to go to war, uh, very complicated and also have to go through the public uh, consultation and also have, to come, have the public buy-in in order to have the war be implemented. So in order to have a total war, I don't think it is uh, possible at this time. Also, we have many new channels of foreign relationships, and we have many supranational platforms for formal and informal dialogues, the UN being one, and there are also others. And for example, in South Asia, there's the ASEAN, and there's the uh, Asia-Pacific uh, uh, Economic Cooperation Platform. There are many, many such platforms that, that, that information can be, can be uh, exchanged, and also for or other uh, uh, dialogues to occur. And I don't think uh, we'll have to rely solely on formal stance and, and positions. And lastly, and uh, the, the last two points I want to raise is that today's world is multifaceted, has a diversity of involvement. And, and security, national security, does not only mean military security, Security can take on different perspectives and contents, such as economic security, informational security, social security, cultural, digital, health, food, water, and other unconventional securities. And also, mind you, remember the color revolutions. And so there's no, not necessary really to go front on with another nation and just to uh, to conquer them or resuppress them or really do something. There are all sorts of ways. And, uh, and, and, and interactions among countries can take on many different more dimensions and many different more arenas. But lastly, lastly, is our biggest enemy is not our opponents on Earth. Our biggest enemy is climate change. It's the na Mother Nature. Mother Nature is walking away from us, and we have to find a way to get it back to support our next generation and next generation. And this is something we have to work together. It is something like the nuclear deterrence. But nuclear deterrence is over a push of a button and happen immediately. But climate change and sustainability is something that, that gradually and insidiously erode away our potential to support ourselves. And this is something that we have to face together, not as a nation, but as a generation of people. That's what I want to end by saying that, although we have different pasts, but we have a common future to face. Thank you.
Well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, uh, on behalf of my uh, kind of panelists together, uh, I would like to say thank you, uh, Book and Mr. President. Uh, when we met first time in New York, uh, you were president of a, a different institution. It's a General Assembly of the United Nations. And uh, you have left us from New York, but uh, you have just a wonderfully nicely settled here, and you became again another president. It's easy to call you always a president. So uh, I thank you so much. Uh, this is really my privilege to be here uh, together with uh, such I mean, distinguished I mean, uh, the panelists uh, to talk about our, not only the past, but uh, talk about, as Mr. Ho said, I mean, our future. And uh, Japan has also, but just I mean, uh, one, one sentence on the uh, Japanese participation to this uh, World War I. Japan was a part of that, as you know, and Japan get uh, so some the uh, so okay uh, uh, Chinto, uh, this is famous of the beer, uh, of course, and also the some so southern islands uh, from the result of the uh, Paris uh, Peace Conference. And uh, but the one thing is uh, probably almost nobody uh, knew about the fact that Japan was a country at the time in the framework of this uh, uh, United uh, League, of United, uh, League of Nations. I mean, the charter uh, we proposed uh, the uh, so this is a time we need a kind of close of inequality, inequality of the races, mm. and uh, rejected uh, women tree. Uh, I mean, all other powers and especially by the United States. Uh, because at the time already, the United States has seen the first sign of potential conflict between United Nations interest and Japanese, so emerging kind of threat, so to speak. And uh, I think probably you are a little bit uh, so puzzled by uh, the only one fact that uh, <coughs> probably so nobody mentioned one another very important player uh, that was or that is Russia. Uh, but from Tokyo point of view, after the Japan-Russia War, 1905 and 06, and especially after the Cold War was over, uh, Russia visibility is almost nothing. Uh, especially when talking about, of course, short terms, uh, we have to, of course, talk to Russian as well. But when we're talking about so medium terms scenario of what I mean, Asia will be, then probably Russia, uh, sorry to say, but the role will be very, very limited. Uh, because of many reasons. Uh, one reason is uh, probably so it's difficult for you, especially I mean uh, the people here in the Serbia, uh, because you are already so near to Russia, the Russian Empire, and the Russia is, of course, geopolitically, uh, it's a huge country, uh, not only uh, Europe, but Asia. But I mean, uh, Russia has two faces in reality in diplomacy, especially. Russia is somehow I mean, a European country. That is the uh, ambition and the desire of Russian, I mean, the regimes, always rulers. Uh, but the Asian part of Russia, uh, what is made of is the resources, huge resources, gas and oils and uh, woods and whatever, but no people. Uh, that that uh, most, I mean, the biggest weak point for Russia, I mean, the series of rulers to really face. Therefore, they have been invited to, uh, for example, the uh, so Koreans or Chinese, you know, to fill this gap uh, so that the Russia can make full use of these resources. So once I have a wonderful uh, conversation with a, a leading woman uh, who was once in the White House and talk about, I mean, uh, Russia. And uh, I personally was really surprised uh, how really an understanding perception of Russia is totally different from, in my observation, reality in Asia. So what I want to say is that Russia's role, at least in the coming probably so years, uh, will be very limited. So as another previous speakers have uh, really uh, the uh, clearly pointed out, uh, now probably two major powers and uh, one regional or I mean a major, I don't know, whatever, uh, is almost three countries. And uh, as Mr. Ho pointed out, uh, 1914 and 2014, totally different uh, in Asian, I mean, uh, the Pacific theater. 
but the one thing is uh, very common in my view, no dominant power there. I think, of course, U.S. is big, and Mr. Obama declared that oh, now America is coming back. And China is, of course, emerging. But we see, I mean, almost every day, even every hour, thanks to the social media, China has a problem. China has not only the problem of climate change, China has a problem of minority issues, borders, and such and such. And the uh, biggest, I mean, a challenge, one of the biggest challenges uh, Mr. Xi is now facing is that how to, how to accommodate and how to probably control the uh, new modern tools of, I mean, a citizen, uh, that is social media, and of course, I mean, the uh, right of expression. So uh, this is uh, another uh, kind of uh, the, uh, so factors uh, to be really closely watched when they're talking about who are more important for not only Asia Pacific region, but the whole, the whole international community. I'm talking about, I mean, so uh, not only I'm a kind of the uh, national industry is now very much uh, limited and uh, difficult to pursue because of the character of international committee has changed dramatically. Uh, but the one thing is uh, very important to really remind uh, ourselves that one thing happens, then that affects you today, not I mean, even tomorrow. Uh, because of many things, uh, not only climate change and only social media, but I think I have to say, I mean, uh, youth, young, young people, and young people with access to knowledge, not only to cell phone, smartphone, but they do have now access to the knowledge, thanks to education, uh, thanks to others, others. And that is, I think, one of the most important driving factors for the world to be really guided. And another factor is, of course, I mean, women. Uh, women, I mean, empowerment. And uh, women's, I mean, opinion should be uh, more and more incorporated when I mean, the leaders really make a kind of decision uh, in formulating even, I mean, security, visit into security diplomacy. So that is another thing, and uh, because uh, my colleague uh, he really mentioned a very delicate question: uh, what is the Middle East? Uh, what is, for example, Africa's role uh, in the coming years? Uh, I have been uh, three years in New York, and uh, for example, we are talking about not new order, but we are talking about a new chapter of, for example, United Nations, and uh, this is not only. And to accommodate some kind of latecomers uh, from the north, uh, like uh, Germany or uh, like Japan, uh, to be part of the council members. But uh, I mean, uh, the, so not only Africans and uh, many Asian or I mean uh, the Caribbean country people uh, really have a strong aspiration. Uh, probably not yet complete, I mean, a transformed I mean, a policy platform, but they do really share a very strong explanation, and international community cannot, cannot neglect that or ignore that. So that is another factor. Uh, when we're talking about the Middle East, then we have to talk about Iran and uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, of course, but we have to talk about Ethiopia, Kenya, and others, and, but it affects our region, Asia. So what, what is Asia? Uh, so Prime Minister from Pakistan, uh, he has his own wonderful people and uh, nuclear bomb and very concrete, I mean, uh, the specific region. And these are very complex factors to define what is Asia. Asia is not one, like Africa is not one. Asia, northern part, northeast part, including Japan and China or I mean, Korean Peninsula, bit different from, of course, ASEAN countries like Philippines, Thailand, and others, and totally different uh, from, for example, south uh, east and uh, southwest. I mean, uh, the, uh, the so Indian Peninsula, half uh, Indian, I mean, same continent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and. Uh, but another perspective from Beijing, then everybody is neighbor. You have a huge, I mean, neighbor's front. It makes everything so difficult for them. 
I have full sympathy. And uh, I think one thing is uh, we should not forget is the, a little bit of military factor. Uh, we are talking about security, then we're talking about always waters, oceans, sea lanes. Therefore, after the Paris uh, conference, Japan became, without really delight, number three biggest I mean, Navy powers after only UK and US. By far numbers, much, much bigger than France and other parts. So why? Because the, uh, this is uh, really the oceans. Oceans decide almost everything in terms of security. Okay. Russia, why Russia is now almost nothing? Because after a Cold War, Russia has withdrawn fleets, ships from Vladivostok. If you don't have any fleet in Vladivostok, they have to repeat again the japan Russia war, easily defeated. They are tired, they, are, they lack in the waters, almost like uh, I uh, flew here to here from Tokyo. It's a long stretch. So when I'm here alive, I'm sort of tired. I have no spirit to fight. So th th this is a fact. So this is what, uh, something we have to always think about. Therefore, I'm really serious concerned about our neighbors, in a sense, tension between ASEAN countries and, I mean, uh, China. Uh, of course, I'm worried about Japan-China bilateral, really tense situations. And uh, my previous speaker is right. Uh, nobody wants to, as he said, big war in the coming foreseeable future at least. But I mean, how can we, I mean, avoid this, some kind of military intervention by chance or by miscalculations? That happened so many times in history. For example, the end, last days of the Soviet Union, they shot down Korean airplane, passenger plane. They killed huge numbers of people, but not by intention. That is somehow by miscalculation of the local commander. So this is another, I think, concern. If the Chinese military is really so big, so, so many portion of the budget, uh, and they do have their own voice. I know the doctrine. They are under the party. But once you do have such a huge army with, uh, I mean, weaponry and uh, such, uh, it would be really something so we have to discuss. Of course, this is a Chinese matter, but not only Chinese matter. As neighbor, uh, we have so kind of really concern, a legitimate concern, we'd like to really talk with Chinese and other neighbors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And uh, to the good people of Serbia, uh, as an Australian where we experience floods so much, uh, our hearts have gone on out to you in recent days with the extraordinary tragedy here. Uh, to uh, Vuk, uh, thank you for your unique energy, enthusiasm and organising power in bringing us from the farthest reaches of the world uh, to Belgrade. But it's good that we're here because uh, there is something so galvanising about the sheer force of location. Uh, and when we're here, barely five minutes walk away from the place at which the Austro-Hungarian ultimatum was uh, issued to the um, Serbian foreign minister in July of 1914, it galvanizes our thinking. And it galvanizes our thinking about what I believe to be the two great directing forces of, uh, of modern uh, international relations. One is this um, overpowering force that we all feel and experience every day. Let's call it economic globalization plus. And the second and countervailing force is the continuing cogency of geography, proximity, nations, and nationalism. And the business of political leadership and diplomatic uh, leadership is to somehow reconcile these two enormous sets of forces, which are both equal realities. Uh, three framing remarks, three propositions about how we in the Asian hemisphere might to reflect in the 20th century about the tragedies, <laughs> tragedies here uh, in the um, <coughs> 
uh, we in Asia might reflect in the 21st century on the tragedies here in the 20th century, and, and then uh, some concluding remarks about the future of the global order. Framing remark number one, and I really want to build on what uh, my good friend Mohammed said earlier this morning about this not just being a European tragedy, because it is so important uh, in the way in which we frame this in our minds, in our construction of the task for the current century. Here in Serbia, we are here, a quarter of the population were killed. It's a framing remark. Uh, if you look at uh, Greater Europe, millions of Russians, French, Austro-Hungarians, British, killed, slaughtered. Look beyond to the key colonial empires and you see uh, the impact of the participation and the subsequent resolutions of the peace conference across the wider world, uh, where we had, um, as Patrick has just reminded us, uh, the impact of Versailles on China, which itself is a contributing state. And Patrick, I've just got to remind you, my third year university uh, examination question was, please explain the impact of the Versailles Conference on the rise of Chinese nationalism and on the rise of the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> so at least in our neighborhood, we are asked to think about these things. Um, but put yourself in the position of the Chinese at the time. 50 years of being kicked around by the British and a bunch of others. First Opium War, Second Opium War, the wars of 1899-1900, uh, the first two of which because the Chinese had the temerity to say they weren't keen on British opium. Um, then China joins the international order after the collapse of the Qing becomes the Chinese Republic. Uh, they then seek to behave in their perception of what it was to be a responsible global citizen barely six years into the Chinese Republic after 2,000 years of empire. And then they are told, um, sorry, take the back seat uh, when it comes to the return of your sovereign territory uh, after the uh, First World War. The impact on the Chinese consciousness of betrayal by the West uh, is a very rich history then and a very potent force today. And of course, it's not just uh, the impact on uh, China, but the impact on India. Uh, let us not forget that the rise of Indian nationalism occurred after massive Indian contributions to the Great War, uh, when, uh, frankly, the British afterwards said, I'm sorry about that independence deal, we'll just put that off for another half a century as well. And so the rise of Gandhi and the rest. And then, of course, the impact in Africa and the rest of colonial Asia. Then, of course, in the broader global framing of this, there are those of us who, as it were, come from the periphery. Now, those of us who got roped into this thing, uh, Canadians, Australians, New Zealanders, uh, from all over the place, um, and, uh, and of course the Americans. And uh, when I think of the fact that uh, in a country like Australia at that stage had a population about the same size as Serbia, 4.5 million, 10% of our population wore the uniform, more than uh, 350, 400,000 fought in Europe, 60,000 killed, uh, 160,000 injured, casualty rate of 65%. I mean, this affected every community in our small country at the other end of the world, none of whom knew how to spell Sarajevo, knew where Serbia was, or what the hell it was all about. I find it quite interesting that the, the two historians of note in the current analysis of the impact of World War I uh, are both Australians and Canadians deeply connected, but also separated from, if you like, the core combatant states. Uh, so thank you, Christopher, and in her absence, Margaret Macmillan. So the point I make about all this is that for the world, as Graham Allison reminds me at the Kennedy School at Harvard University, where I now work, there can be no limit to the amount of study we should dedicate to World War I in framing our view of lessons for the future. It affected us all and was the first global war. A couple of other quick uh, framing points, not as long as that one. Um, I said before uh, that uh, the implications of World War I in the Asian hemisphere, the Asia Pacific, were significant. Uh, we've mentioned India, we've mentioned China, and China and Japan. Think also of the United States, which we think of as an Asia Pacific power. And uh, after World War, II and World War I and the Great Conflagration and, and uh, the exuberance of Wilsonian idealism and the proposition of the League, the monumental reaction against all global engagement and foreign wars and foreign interventions for the subsequent 20 years of American history. Again, a direct consequence. And final framing remark, just as an Australian. Um, at our best, what is an Australian perspective on these things? I think at our best, we are the West and the East. 
Um, and if at our really best, we can sometimes be the East and the West and being uh, detached but part of all of the above. And perhaps there's something, therefore, in these reflections which makes them a little different. Three propositions for the future of the Asian hemisphere coming out of the experiences of World War I. Number one, no one expected the Great War to happen. The seminal conclusions of uh, Christopher Clarke's great history is that even as of the beginning of 1914, as of May 14, 100 years ago from today, there was no belief that this thing could happen. Uh, your competitor newspaper, the New York Times, in its uh, New Year's Day editorial of 1914, celebrated the new rapprochement which was underway between Germany, France, and England. And so was the spirit of the age. So my cautionary tale is this. My cautionary tale is this. Globalization hasn't changed everything. The power and potency of deep nationalism still exists around the world, in particular in our hemisphere. If you look at uh, the Asia Pacific region, it is a dynamic, um, productive, highly engaged, integrated 21st century economy sitting across the top of a positively 19th century set of security policy realities, 19th century set of outstanding unresolved territorial disputes, and by and large 19th century sets of nationalisms. And that is our dilemma in our part of the world. And so the cautionary tale for those of us in the Asian hemisphere looking back 100 years, when they thought that this couldn't happen, in the literature of the time that the globalization of the early 20th century was such that this could never happen. Now, I, this is my cautionary response to your observations, Patrick, which I fear are too optimistic, is that we too can drift into conflict in Asia. And the sheer mechanics of crisis management, particularly in the events of from the 28th of July to the guns of August, and the weeks leading up to the 28th of July 1914, are cautionary tales in particular about the management of crises when they erupt. Proposition number two uh, relates to uh, the whole question uh, of um, how uh, you manage uh, the difficulty of these sorts of uh, tensions at the same time as you have a global transition of power underway as well. What were the dynamics in Europe in terms of great power transition? You had uh, Britain fearing the rise of Germany as um, your cautionary tale at the beginning of uh, uh, this uh, seminar caused us to think and to rethink to make sure we ticked all the right boxes with the right states. Um, and then of course you had uh, German concerns about the rise of Russia. Uh, both of which are well documented in the various recent histories which have been produced. And so against that prism, you had a further fundamental destabilizing set of dynamics around which the specificities of what occurred here in the Balkans and elsewhere trans, trans, uh, transformed, uh, or shall I say, transposed themselves. In our part of the world and globally, uh, a parallel debate emerges, of course, in terms of the existing uh, great power and superpower, the United States, and the emerging great power, which is China. I don't believe we can underestimate the significance of this transition, um, whether it's in perception or unfolding reality. And again, I take a little exception with Patrick on this one, um, even though we're regional neighbors. Um, and that is that uh, even when China becomes the world's largest economy, which depending on your method of calculation will be either next year, within the next five years, or the next 10 years, purchasing power parity, readjustments, market exchange rates, you take your pick. But let's just be cautious and say it's within the next decade. This will be the first time since George III was on the throne of England that the largest economy in the world will be non-Western, non-democratic, and a non-English speaking country. So anyone who thinks this is just kind of an interesting you know, little change, uh, I suspect that is not the case. Because when you are the, uh, the primus inter pares globally economically, let me tell you, it begins to shape what rules at least pertain within the global economic order, and then over time, the diplomatic and political order beyond whatever may happen militarily. And so therefore, my... Uh, uh, second proposition arising from this reflection on the First World War is along these lines. That the core uh, of uh, the um, uh, equilibrium or disequilibrium in the Asia Pacific lies in the future trajectory of this critical and crucial bilateral relationship between China and the United States. Xi Jinping calls for a new type of great power relationship, Xinxing Dao Guanxi. 
It's a term of art now and a term of uh, debate in everything which is alive within the Chinese academy and public policy circles. At present, it's a headline without any content to populate it. And so the key question is, given all that is going on, can proactive diplomacy construct a way in which this, manage, this relationship could be managed at a time of fundamental, at least geoeconomic transition, and possibly geopolitical and geodiplomatic as well? And one proposal I've put forward, um, and I think it needs to be elaborated with others, is that how can these two, econ these two systems, which are so vastly different, but are now participants in the global economic order, shape new global public goods together? New global public goods. The legitimate complaint about the uh, post-45 settlement is that it was done by a bunch of uh, white guys, essentially, 50 of them, in a room, San Francisco pro conference, and the other 150 in the current international order have kind of had to just lump it uh, ever since then. I understand how they feel, okay? And in 1945, we Australians, uh, always disrespectful, uh, we saw ourselves as a bit of a champion for the non-great powers and the way in which the economic and social charters of the of the UN Charter were written. In fact, one of my foreign ministerial predecessors did a lot of the drafting of those sections of the UN Charter. To enable the little countries, the small countries, the middle countries to have more of a say. And to ensure this was not just a geopolitical settlement, but it had an economic dimension and a social dimension. A reflection, if you like, of global Keynesian concerns that we had imbibed in the period since uh, the mid-30s. So my point is this. Can we, through the US and China, develop new levels of strategic trust which currently don't exist in their bilateral relationship by the two of them constructing new global public goods which benefit not just them but the rest of us but critically help to build trust together? Final proposition for the Asia Pacific um, and the way in which it unfolds uh, for the 21st century. Uh, learning from the events of 1914. In 1914, there was no European institution. Um, you sort of uh, idly talked about um, the, uh, the concert of Europe and whatever happened out of uh, Metternich and uh, the Congress of Vienna uh, after Napoleon had been removed from the European stage. But essentially, uh, the um, the uh, settlement in uh, 1815 and the settlement in 1919 occurred after two great European conflagrations. And there was no mitigating institution which exists prior to them, frankly. And the great enduring lesson of post-45 Europe is that finally our good friends the French and the Germans decided three mass slaughters within 70 years was probably enough for anybody and we should think about doing it differently. And thank God they did. Many people criticize the European project. As someone who is an historian by instinct, I never do. It is a remarkable institution in putting to bed the ancient demons of history. And so my third proposition for our friends in East Asia, of which we are part in the Asian hemisphere, is to grow the institutional arrangements of East Asia in a manner that they can begin through conscious diplomatic decision making to reduce pre-existing national tensions. Not eliminate them, but to manage and to reduce. Those which do exist are thin. And the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Conference, a Japanese-Australian diplomatic initiative from the late 1980s. The um, ASEAN Regional Forum, an Australian diplomatic initiative from the 80s, I think, or 90s, 90s. And then the more recently, the East Asian Summit, which we now have the inclusion through good Indonesian diplomacy, uh, together with some of the rest of us, the US and Russia as well. How do we build this to begin to unfold confidence as security building measures? An OSCE type process at least. Methods by which you can manage incidents at sea before they simply escalate into something beyond our control. My concluding point in terms of the overall global order I think is um, along these lines. Beyond the US-China transition question, let's stand back and look at the grand transition which is underway. For 500 years, really, since de Gama, Diaz, and Columbus jumped on boats and, quote, discovered uh, the new world. Um, I thought it existed before they discovered it, but that's a separate question. Um, the, uh, but in our schools, we're always taught they discovered it, uh, and then Cook a couple of hundred years I later. I grew up in Mexico, not mine. That's right, okay. 
The, uh, the what's the Spanish view on the discovery of Mexico? Uh, the conquest. You mean the, uh, yeah, the yeah. rape of Mexico? <laughs> yeah, conquest. Dis yeah, yeah, discovery, conquest, and those things which follow it. Is that after 500 years, the center of geoeconomic gravity has moved to East Asia. And prospectively, when I look at the dynamism of Latin America and I look at the dynamism of many states in Africa, there is a fundamental global shift un underway as well. It'll take some time to work through. But what do all the others have in common? By and large, they've all been colonized by the rest of us. Uh, and frankly, if you understand, I think as our good friend from Senegal said before, the impact of that on the national psychologies of the countries of uh, Africa uh, and certainly of Asia, where every country with the exception of the Kingdom of Thailand was colonized and Japan uh, for most of the period from about the 16th century, is that there is a legitimate expectation that there is about to be a different season. But here's the problem. If the rules of the international system are to be changed, changed into what? Remember what Churchill said about democracy, the worst system of government in the world except for all the others? That's kind of my view of the UN. It's the worst system of international government in the world except for all the others. Uh, so the question is, how do we actually enhance the rules of this system? And what's the proposition within it I put? The great powers, by and large, are relatively content with the system. Post-45, they became P5. And unless anyone here has got news to the contrary, I don't see the P5 changing much into the future. Anyone got any news recently from New York to suggest that or the other five capitals? I don't think so. Have you ever known a nation state to say I've got a bunch of power I'm about to give it to you? Um, not in my recent memory. So, but there are a bunch of us in the UN system who are not great powers, who are middle powers, who are small powers, but the great term I like in international relations theory is constructive powers, whose single objective it is because they are not big enough to obtain um, their most basic national objectives unilaterally, is, and that they therefore need a multilateral system to underpin the uh, rules of the system which protect them, that we need a new group of, a term which I phrased this morning, listening to uh, Mohammed carefully, a new coalition of the multilaterally willing, uh, the uh, CMW, uh, to make the system work. Be realistic, you can't change it overnight, but frankly, if enough of us do with sufficient critical mass, in terms of our diplomacy, our economics, and the rest of it, it could be a voice which cannot be ignored against the single pr principle that a rules-based system underpinning open politics, open economies, open societies, a rules-based system and protection of sovereignty is not beyond the reach of us all. Political leadership is necessary for that. But I think we can get there. And uh, rather than be simply uh, pessimistic about the prospect that history repeats itself, we're condemned to repeat it. You know, I, I have a non-determinist view of these things. We can make a difference. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> on the very topic of our sessions, uh, allow me first to state that there are many uncomfortable parallels between the mul multipolar world of the decades leading to the outbreak of the First World War and the current uh, multipolar world of our time, including in East Asia. Britain, which ruled the waves, controlling the seas and ruling the global empire of colonies, was being challenged by Germany. Uh, Germany overtook Britain economically and built, built up its armaments on land and sea and asserted its claim for a place in the sun. In East Asia, following the end of the Cold War, American global supremacy is being challenged by the peaceful rise of China. Soon, in the less than a decade, uh, China would overtake the United States uh, and the number one, as the number one economy, uh, uh, the global economy. In fact, according to the latest World Bank study, uh, in terms of the purchasing power parity, the GNP, uh, gross domestic product of China is now slightly bigger than the United States. Militarily, the United, uh, as China claims it is one generation uh, behind the United States, 
but as China now spend more money for its military built up, uh, no doubt China already being a nuclear power uh, and aggressively building its conventional weapons, including uh, naval uh, career, began to project its power uh, in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Germany, before 1914, asserted its claim in Africa and the Middle East. Today, China is sable rattling, flexing its muscles over the disputed islands, Senkaku, as Japan call it, or Dayu Islands in the East China Sea, and also over the para, of the Paracel and Spratly Islands and the rocks in the South China Sea. China also claims uh, of a vast expanse of water in the South China Sea, uh, loosely defined as nine dash line, on the basis uh, that for ages, uh, China, I mean, this part of the sea uh, belonged to China. Its historical claims, or historical claims, claims actually has no legal basis under the United Nations a Convention on the Law of the Sea. On the multipolar East Asia, first, I said, uh, uh, what do we mean by East Asia? In the pure geographical terms, East Asia comprises of Northeast and Southeast Asia. But in ASEAN lexicon, initially it was meant as ASEAN plus three, 10 ASEAN countries plus China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, but in 2004, as we prepared for the first East Asian summit as a vehicle towards the creations of an East Asia, uh, an East Asia community, uh, we redefine East Asia to also include India, which by definition is South Asia, but also Australia and New Zealand. Southwest Pacific. So in total, we have uh, the East Asian Summit from nine, rather 2005 to 2000, uh, 2010, 16 countries of East Asia. Indonesia then championed for a more balanced and inclusive East Asia for reasons that Indonesia believes that if East Asia is limited to 12, uh, none of the 12 or combines of the 12 countries in the region is in a position to balance China. Uh, it is in these connections that the, uh, is the importance of the U.S. FIFA, the U.S. rebalancing its position in East Asia or uh, larger Asia Pacific regions. This is not new, actually, since the Pearl Harbor and uh, in the end of the Second World War, uh, uh, the United States remains a dominant power in the Asia-Pacific regions. Indonesia did not believe that when one day China holds both uh, uh, status as number one economy uh, in the world, and the most powerful uh, country in the regions militarily, uh, China would continue to be or to, re be, uh, to remain peaceful. Something that Indonesia began to sense, indeed experience, by mid-2009, only four or five years after we thought that we need to create a more balanced and inclusive East Asia uh, Summit. Uh, so it was uh, quite reassuring last April when the Foreign Ministry of China made a public statement that at least between Indonesia and China, we do not have an overlapping claims of a water in the South China Sea. And this actually allowing Indonesia to continue to play a facil facilitating role in managing potential conflicts in the South China Sea, in particular by bringing all parties of the conflicts to go back to the path of dialogue, something that which we did from 1994 to 2002. 
Uh, in 2011, the participants of the East Asia Summit was expanded to include the United States and Russia, made East Asia Summit with 18 participants. The key players are uh, ASEAN, because it is an ASEAN-sponsored uh, activity, China, Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, and New Zealand, as well as the United States and Russia. The expansions uh, further complicates, in a way, on matter of substance, what do we mean by East Asia Summit? There's a competing interpretation here in terms of areas of operations uh, that we wish to develop. For President Obama from the United States uh, at the summit in, 19, in 2011, stated that uh, to the United States, East Asia Summit is nothing but a forum of dialogue for political, security, and uh, strategic issues. Uh, while for some six summits, East Asia, uh, was, East Asia Summit was focused more on the economic cooperations. So I'm very much in line with what uh, a good friend of mine, uh, <coughs> Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, just said, that we need to add, strengthen the agenda of political and security cooperations in the East Asia Summit. Uh, because so far, uh, when we talk about uh, cooperation, integration, community building in East Asia, we talk more on economic cooperation, economic integration, economic community. So there has been an imbalance, and that's why uh, to us, uh, it is a need to balance the concept of corporations. Uh, yes, the importance of economic, but nonetheless, the importance of political and security corporations. Uh, that's why we are very much behind when we talk about uh, political and security cooperation, not to compare ourselves with the European Union, but to other regional organizations. And that's why we are uh, uh, having problems to cope with the increasing tensions or potential conflicts in the East and South China Sea. Uh, of course, on the economic front, uh, our region is a very dynamic one. Uh, <clears throat> we discuss uh, how we soon uh, create an East Asia-wide uh, free trade area. This means market of 3.4 billion of countries which have increasing uh, buying power. Uh, look at the G20. Six of the countries of East Asia are members of the G20. But look at the uh, 10 top countries economically, at least by using the uh, recent study of the World Bank, four of East Asian countries' economies are among the top ten. And the region's uh, contributions to the world GDP is also expected to rise. And by 2040, uh, <coughs> the contributions of East Asian economies to the world GDP would be around 65 percent. That's why the 21st century is often labeled as the century of the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, that's why it is confusing to hear uh, from the regions, the regions of the 21st century, the news about conflicts, South China Sea, North China Sea. And, and this is our challenge. Uh, so, uh, but on the political and security order, uh, please keep in mind that Asia is a very wide and diverse region. We don't have an Asia-wide organizations or Asia-Pacific-wide regional organizations beyond APEC, which is very much economics again. And we, do, we only have sub-regional organizations such as ASEAN, SARC, GALP, or GCC, ECO, Shanghai Initiative. And for that matter, uh, 
ASEAN is considered, considered as the most successful sub-regional organizations, at least from the perspective that in the past 47 years, we continue to enjoy relative peace and security, which in the end allow us to focus our energy, time, and resources for our economic development. That's why a rather dynamic economy of uh, Southeast Asia, which is part and parcel of the larger uh, uh, dynamics of the East Asia, uh, East Asian regions. Uh, after, fo after 40 years of its existence, ASEAN is uh, now in the process of transforming itself from rather loose associations into a community based on three pillars, ASEAN political and security community, ASEAN economic community, and ASEAN socio-cultural socio community. This is very much Indonesian concepts, because we don't want to see, like our experience in 1997 and 98, that because of the imbalanced concept of development, we suffered. Uh, Indonesia was on the brink of collapse. Uh, that's why our concept for more balanced cooperation in ASEAN, as now we have successfully enshrined all those purposes and principles in the new ASEAN Charter of 2008, that's why we try to project uh, a more balanced cooperation in the East Asian region, including at the East Asian Summit. Uh, On the economic front, uh, we can anticipate that uh, we will have soon an, Asia, an East Asia-wide uh, free trade area. We have now in place uh, quite a mix of ASEAN plus one. We call it ASEAN China free trade area, ASEAN Japan, ASEAN India, ASEAN Australia, ASEAN New Zealand free trade area, including, I should have mentioned, uh, Korea. Of course. So uh, we are now working for new uh, regional economic uh, partnerships. Uh, quite uh, 16 countries' uh, cooperations. Uh, at the same time, in the regions of Asia-Pacific, uh, we have an active process, what is called uh, Trans-Pacific Partnerships, led by the United States. But it's also involving five or six countries of ASEAN. So there's an overlapping, but overlapping doesn't mean bad, but uh, I believe that the current two processes, the East Asian Economic Partnerships and TPP, as we call it, on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that eventually would lead to uh, a greater Asia-Pacific uh, free trade area with some 27, 28 uh, participants. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, to me at least, uh, we need to strengthen the political and security cooperations, uh, and, and I think we should uh, design a kind of a community of power of Wilsonian type uh, on an organized common peace instead of uh, the uh, balance of power, which, as in the case of Europe, has been proven that it didn't guarantee an equilibrium. And so this is what we hope. Uh, that's why the need to strengthen the East Asia Summit to, on, on the, in particular on the uh, political and security cooperations. So it is a race against time, at least on uh, these tensions and conflicts in the South China Sea, North, I mean, East China Sea, we fail. But as we are continually engaging actively, uh, what we need is to expand to make uh, the East Asian cooperation truly balanced. The importance, yes, the importance of economic cooperation, but nonetheless, political and security cooperations. Thank, Thank you. you.
know time is running uh, long, uh, but uh, what I'd like to propose is a, a kind of a lightning round of questions because some very provoking and very interesting things were said, and then I'd like to open it up to the audience. But I, I really want to start with Prime Minister Aziz because you said something that's absolutely electric. I know what you I know you know what I mean. I know. Um, and so I'd like you to expand a little bit on the view. But just say it in case we're on the okay. same page. Okay, a little bit on the view. It was not about soft power, although that point was very well taken. On the importance of a nuclear deterrent yeah. in maintaining peace in the post-World War II era, a distinguishing characteristic, something that has maintained a rough peace, at least, between India and Pakistan. And is it something you might prescribe in East Asia? <laughs> I think to, I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you very much. I think to understand the, uh, the whole context of the comment I made, you must have a reasonable understanding of uh, South Asia, which I know you do. Uh, each region is different. I am not here to advocate nuclear weapons as a guarantee for peace. Because, uh, and certainly not uh, the answer, quick answer to your question is for East Asia. The point here is slightly different. We have uh, in South Asia one large country and several, uh, two or three medium-sized countries and some small countries like Maldives and Sri Lanka, etc. So it's a mix and match of different power centers. What we have seen, the point I'm making is that because our nuclear program was a direct reflection and creation of what India did. Now, you could say, why do you follow each other? Because we don't want to live under any hegemonic influence from anywhere. And no country does. We are sovereign countries. We want to have our freedom. Having, when that happened, we launched our own efforts to do what we have succeeded today. And today, we have... Uh, uh, a pretty impressive nuclear capability. However, we as a nation, and my government, it, to the extent I was there for several years, eight years, we made it very clear. We believe in peace with strength. You cannot have peace with weakness, especially in the environment we live in. So for us to maintain peace, we must have strength. And strength <coughs> has to be relative to those areas and those countries who, propose, who represent a potential threat. At the same time, diplomacy has to work, engagement has to work, economic ties. I talked about interdependencies and linkages. I am very encouraged, actually, with the recent elections in India and the reaction in Pakistan. This was not your question, but it's linked to this yeah. whole comment. I think. India now will have a strong government, and the Pakistani government, my successors, they are also ready to talk, and they have said this publicly, to come to some arrangements with India which lower the temperature by creating those linkages I referred to in my comments. So a strong government in India will get us, take us very far. So I think the environment in South Asia today is better than it used to be. Everybody has to step up. Everybody has to seize the moment. Everybody has to show some leadership. And I think the ingredients are there today between India and Pakistan. Now we have another challenge, which is Afghanistan, which is a global challenge, not just a, a South Asian challenge. The withdrawal from, uh, by various foreign forces from Afghanistan will create of quite a unique situation in terms of a vacuum. So that has to be filled. And my uh, bias, maybe it's my bias and my background, that one way to tackle it is economic growth. You have to really create opportunities, un unravel the country. Afghanistan has energy resources, mineral resources, etc. If you can give people an honest uh, uh, way to earn money and to live peacefully, they will come. Uh, and join the bandwagon. I believe that I've been to more, uh, more times to Afghanistan and spent time with the people and leadership there than anybody in this room, I'm pretty sure. So I think Afghanistan has to be tackled separately. India, Pakistan will always be a challenge. But today, I think the environment is better than I've seen in a long time. The willingness to act, the willingness to talk, and the willingness to get these issues 
at least uh, put on the side, if not solved, so that we can focus on the basic issues, which is poverty, growth, the social sector, all the challenges which exist in the world, and uh, South Asia is no exception. Thank you very much. Thank you. You also said, um, first of all, I, I'm happy to uh, receive awards at Khan. I'm sure you will. Uh, <laughs> if I have the right actress on my arm, at least. Um, the, uh, <laughs> you never know, right? Um, you said something that was, that was quite fascinating, uh, um, and which is the, the fact is that great economic power does not always translate right. into great geopolitical, strategic, or military power. Uh, do you think, do you foresee a trajectory for China in which just that scenario happens? And if so, how do we account for tensions in places like South China or East China Sea? Okay, good question to ask. Uh, first of all, China is a country that abides by these words. China has never, modern China, has never broken any international covenant or agreement that it has entered into. And you can look up the records for that. The second thing is China is very predictable. History repeats itself, and I would say China repeats itself. China has 5,000 years of history, and the recent rise is not the rise of China. It's, it's the fourth or fifth rise of China. Or you can, if you can really dice it up, it can be the eighth rise. And according to Chinese historians, every 600 to 800 years, China would rise once. Starting from about 1,000 years BC, in the Shang Dynasty, there was the most glorious uh, uh, dynasties in China, the Shang Dynasty. Then it was the Han Dynasty in about 200 BC. Then it was the Tang Dynasty, about 600 AD. Then it was the Ming Dynasty in the 1400. Then you can extrapolate what is going to the next one, okay, which is about 2200. Then will be the next peak. That will be the fifth rise of China. But let's look at what happened to China the last time it rose. In 1400, in the Ming Dynasty, when the Emperor Zhu Di, in all his glories and splendor, sent the, the Chinese Armada down the, down the South China Sea with 5,000 of his people and 2,000 2, feet. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the admirals that were leading that was Zheng He, as a eunuch, okay? And he sailed the South China Sea seven times, starting the first time in 1421, 70 years before uh, uh, Crystal Columbus. And it was said that Magellan and, and Gama, all these people sailed the South China Sea to Australia on, according to the maps made by the Chinese at that time. Okay. It was even proposed that Zheng He discover America before Christopher Columbus did. Okay, what did Zheng He did with all his Chinese armada down the South China Sea seven times? When Julius Caesar said, I came, I saw, I conquered, okay. Zheng He was saying, I came, I saw, and I went home. <laughs> Nothing happened. Okay, except that many of his sailors uh, became natives and married uh, to the native people and settled down in South China seas, and Chinese culture spread, spread it according to that. But nothing happened. China revered the, the, the type of, if you call it a hegemon, it's not a military hegemon. We revere the type of hegemon that Antonio Gramsci said, hegemon, cultural hegemon. You know, we, and, and that's what China wants to be. It's not by really uh, conquering the, 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 the foreign lands and getting tributes and all that. It's by cultural attractions, by all this magnificence, by all these magnanimities, attract other countries into his, to become his friends. And that's what China is, wants to do. If you look at modern China, China is a, is, a, is a big country. It's the longest boundary of 22 kilometers with 14 
sovereign state as members. There's the, there's the largest country. And that's why it needs a big army, a big military force to defend its, its, uh, its borders. And that's why the, the increase of military budget spending. Okay, but that being said, in, if you look at modern China, in all its territorial dispute, they were all together since 1949, 23 territorial disputes. And it has so far settled 19 of them peacefully. Peacefully. Out of 23, settled 19 percent peacefully. And through negotiations and with compromises in 17 out of 23 territorial disputes, often agreeing to accept less than half of the territory being disputed. And in 15 disputes, the compromise created conditions for final territorial settlement through bilateral agreement. So far, the outstanding territorial disputes have not been settled yet from, for modern China. It's one, Taiwan, there's two, Paracel Island, three, the Sprati Island, it's all in South China Sea, and the fourth in East China Sea, the Senkaku or Daoyudo Islands. Those are the four outstanding ones. China is very much at ease with that, okay? For, uh, I mean, uh, from my standpoint, China, you know, the South China Sea and East China Sea is done deal. It's no big deal. We don't want to mess with that, provided everybody was kept status quo. If you don't alter the status quo, nothing will happen. Just, just a brief follow-up, just a one minute. Didn't the emperor burn the fleet after, afterwards? No, it's, it's because of internal politics. They, uh, I mean, the, the uh, 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 Zheng He sort of overshadowed the power of the emperor and, and was threatening to overthrow the emperor. And that's why he burned the fleet. Okay, so the leadership in Beijing now will not burn the new fleet. <laughs> well, they're trying to build one. Um, uh, Ambassador Nishida, you know, it's worth speaking now, uh, literally here, there is a dialogue in uh, Singapore, the, the Shangri-La dialogue that, that, that's taking place, where you hear some uh, very bellicose statements from the American Secretary of Defense, uh, uh, not, I shouldn't say bellicose, but um, Maybe. muscular statements mm -hmm. from the American Secretary of Defense, uh, uh, Chuck Hagel. Uh, Prime Minister Abe has also uh, spoken up quite, uh, uh, quite forcefully. There was, I want you to do me a favor because the, the senior civilian leader, the Chinese civilian leader responding to Prime Minister Abe's address, uh, Madam Fu, um, accused yeah. Japan of using the Senkaku or Diayu Island dispute as uh, essentially an excuse or a provocation for Japanese remilitarization. And she also claimed that Japan is in denial about uh, war crimes committed by Japanese in uh, the Second World War. Um, I know I'm putting you a bit on the spot, but uh, offer us a response to that to that charge from Madam Fu. Well, well, thank you uh, for really a very important question, and of course, uh, before I mean, I would like to share my um, personal uh, opinion with all of you. I have to just remind you, I have retired from the government. So what I'm going to say. Sorry, uh, what I'm going to say is a more personal uh, opinion. And uh, I think, as I said, uh, this is a very important uh, kind of the, the question and a very timely question. And the two things, uh, I think so sometimes, or even many times, it would be difficult uh, for international community, including the United States, uh, to distinguish two different issues. One is, so to speak, I mean, the history issues or past issues, including, okay, so many, so to speak, uh, according to uh, Chinese friends, then unresolved issues, and that should be settled uh, in a peaceful way. Uh, because, I mean, uh, the international uh, kind of arrangement after uh, the uh, Second World War over uh, was not, I mean, uh, clear-cut enough to settle those remaining issues. That is one issue. 
Another issue is that today is, I mean, a main kind of the subject matter. Uh, how could we really, I mean, uh, pursue the uh, more peaceful and uh, situation where not only Japan but the U.S. and of course China and uh, other Asian and Pacific countries could coexist in a more, I mean, a peaceful and more mutually beneficial way. And uh, in that context, I mean, uh, the kind of military, I mean, uh, the uh, role is something we have to discuss in a serious way. And another thing is, uh, Mr. Rudd uh, said uh, in an eloquent way, so I think, as I said before, uh, the uh, age of India of the 1914, uh, then we didn't have any overarching kind of the uh, frameworks or, I mean, a kind of the mechanisms to prevent the uh, so potential conflict, and this situation is remain still. It's the same situations, and uh, as I said before, uh, in the year of uh, 1914, no sole Asian country who really ruled the, uh, this really huge I mean, uh, region, and now again the same. So you may name it, so uh, I mean, uh, it's a G2, uh, like some okay, American so journalists like to express that, or I mean multipolar, well, in my humble expression, it's non-polar. Uh, this is a kind of vacuum. Uh, we should really, I mean, fill that vacuum in more sophisticated way. Uh, this is a challenge for diplomacy, and as I think, this is also a challenge, or well, I mean, so the house, uh, who are the homework for, I mean, a Chinese diplomacy as well. So uh, back to your question. Uh, I think uh, Japan want to really more assertive uh, in order to pursue our, not only national interests, but the interests of regional and global interests. Because as I said, now regional and uh, global, I don't see any demarcation. Everything is so, I mean, not interconnected, like Mr. Ho said, I mean, for example, climate change. Well, I mean, a financial flow, huge, I mean, the amount of money are already running through Wall Street, Tokyo market, London, and Singapore, and of course the Chinese market, that will really, I mean, decide many substantial part of our life. Uh, it is undeniable. Uh, so I think we need both short term and short to, I mean, the medium terms kind of mechanism to at least, as Mr. Lars said, not necessarily entirely, totally resolve the issues, but we have to really contain and reduce the risk in coming okay, years so that everybody will be given more time and uh, to think about what is our interest. And uh, I think uh, he's completely right. China is a huge country. China probably has not okay, invaded the neighbors, but China has in-house. Therefore, China has now such a huge number of minorities. And it's, uh, I think, probably strength, but the weakness of China when talking about, I mean, a future kind of the uh, role of international society. And, but I think the same thing, China should really understand neighbors' interests as well. Uh, like, okay, uh, but the ASEAN countries, uh, like Australia and like uh, so Japan. And uh, another point is, I think this is very important. Uh, of course, we are talking about two big giants, so United States and China. I don't deny that. But no agreement between America and China never be able to last for some time without Japanese positive participation. Japan is too big to be ignored by not only Russia, sorry, I mean China and the United States. So therefore, it's a, I think it's a good time for U.S. Secretary of Defense made a very clear-cut statement where America stands and whom America stands for. This is overdue. I really personally welcome that. Thank you. Um, uh, Prime Minister Rudd, uh, you, you were talking about this historic transition of power, uh, first since, uh, since George III, and I guess maybe this is a, a slightly uh, a par parochial and self-interested question, but I think it would be good to have your view, especially in light of what the ambassador just, just said. 
what is America's role in Asia in this transition where China is becoming not only the dominant regional, but perhaps a dominant global player? What role should the United States be playing going forward? I think um, three roles are essential. One, uh, to be clear in its public diplomacy and its operational diplomacy, uh, what the United States intends to do in Asia uh, over the next uh, 25 years. Uh, the rebalance expresses that, um, but when you hear so many dissonant voices about that in the Washington establishment and the US defense establishment, then questions are raised about that. Clarity. Number two, uh, in terms of um, the management of the bilateral relationship with China, both leaders did something really good last year, Xi Jinping and uh, President Obama. They conducted for the first time in Sino-US relations history a working level summit. You might think that's been a long time coming. Um, it has been and many of us advocated for it. And the reason is uh, to have a regular annual working level summit to go through the whole range of global, regional and bilateral issues, rather than simply do so either on the edge of other global meetings or uh, when there's a crisis. This is the forum through which I believe the US and China can begin to add, um, shall I say, new items of strategic cooperation together rather than simply note the items of strategic mistrust. Um, and by doing that, you can step by step build trust. For example, someone here correctly mentioned earlier today that an abiding and growing global challenge for the China and the United States uh, given the size of their global carbon footprints, number one and number two respectively, is that they in their own hands control the future of climate change. By and large, they do. Uh, neither are, uh, shall I say, classical Kyoto Protocol ratification states. Both, however, to varying levels, are seized at the challenge. The Chinese are taking a series of national measures, but put a, all that to one side. You see already the manifestation of an aspect of carbon pollution's impact on the quality of life in China through massive levels of particulate um, pollution in the atmosphere in China major cities, China's major cities. The impact of climate change in terms of um, uh, the adequacy of water supplies and the feeding of Chinese agricultural needs in the future, intense storm activity. This constitutes a new part of the global commons which these two great economies with massive carbon footprints need to solve for themselves but also for the rest of us. Why do I put it in this frame? If they manage to do that by whatever mechanism they choose, and I assume it's outside the multilateral framework, it is of direct consequence to everyone on the planet but also assists in building strategic trust between the two of them, which in other domains it is difficult to find the area in which that can be done. My final point is within the region. As, um, as uh, Foreign Minister Wiriuda said before, the truth is this, um, we now, through changes in 2011, have America and China around a common diplomatic table of 18 states called the East Asian Summit, which the region can evolve in whichever direction it wants in the future or chooses not to. It is the vehicle which can either be built up as a mechanism to manage regional disputes or simply allowed to wither. I have argued for five years it should be built up and that is why I was a strong advocate of its expansion and earlier that as a vehicle or a stepping stone to building long term an Asia Pacific community which has in, our, has in its mindset the mechanisms embarked upon the Europeans after a major conflagration in the 1950s rather than doing it after a conflagration in East Asia sometime this century. So I think there are three areas for American leadership. However, in our region, it doesn't take one to tango, it takes two to tango, and sometimes it takes a number of us to tango as well, or at least to foxtrot. <laughs> <laughs> off on this and, and we're going to con uh, con uh, conclude with you. So um, I'd like to put you uh, in the role, forgive the, the analogy, but we've, we've spoken so much about regional institutions. I want you to see yourself as the Jean Monnet of, of um, uh, Asia in this century. What are the kinds of steps you would take 
with a view towards creating the kind of EU-like regional structures, what is possible and what are the first steps that Asian countries can begin to take along the road to that kind of vision? <clears throat> when we drafted the new ASEAN Charter in 2008, we discussed whether or not we should put specific article mentioning the ultimate format of ASEAN, as we agreed on ASEAN community, whether or not it would reach to an ASEAN union. Uh, I'm among those who argue against it, because uh, as ASEAN developed in the past 47 years, we didn't have from the very beginning, and this very ASEAN or Asian way, meaning that we don't uh, uh, need to mention the ultimate format of ASEAN. But uh, one thing which uh, an issue of concern in the wider ASEAN Pacific regions is, uh, unfortunately, in comparison with Europe, with Africa, with uh, uh, Latin America, uh, we are very much behind. This is uh, an area that we need to strengthen in the regions, namely on the promotions of democracy and human rights. Uh, we talked a lot yesterday about the contributions of democracy in, uh, in, in, the, in Europe that uh, in a way contributed also to uh, peace and security. Uh, in our regions, we have a huge deficit. Uh, Indonesia was itself uh, 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 <coughs> suffer of uh, uh, deficit in democracy and human rights. But since the reform in 1998, we became a good promoter. I initiated, for example, in 2008, the establishment of the Bali Democracy Forum. In the past three years, uh, it was attended by some 80 countries and organizations making it the global premier forum on uh, democracy dialogues, but also we establish uh, the Institute for Peace and Democracy. And from uh, uh, through this, we develop quite a country-specific program, such as Indonesia-Egypt dialogue, Indonesia-Tunisia dialogue, Indonesia-Myanmar, uh, uh, and Indonesia-Fiji, in addition to many uh, thematic programs. This is something that uh, still sensitive issue uh, in East Asia. Even the words democracy and human rights are still uh, uh, sensitive. That's why, but we have to talk. We have to address these uh, problems because uh, in the end, only when we countries in the regions have more or less I'm not saying same political orientations, but at least if we narrow the gaps between the uh, militaristic authoritarians uh, on the one hand to uh, democracy and respect of human rights, we at the same time contribute to the peace and security in the regions. So um, summing up, peace through strength, self-restraint, um, uh, not ignoring any country, um, uh, not uh, uh, democracy and human rights, and above all, statesmen who uh, know how to dance. I think that's a good formula. Going <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.